Greetings and welcome to another SDEC session. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, before I hand it off to our speaker, just a couple housekeeping items. My name is Adam Greco and I will be your moderator here. If you have any technical problems with Zoom or need some help with anything related to the SDEC, I will be monitoring the Zoom chat and you're welcome to send me a message privately or publicly um, in the chat and I'll see if I can help you out as Jim is presenting. <clears throat> During the presentation, um, if you have questions for Jim, our speaker, uh, please use the Zoom Q&A area. Um, every time we do this, we end up with people asking questions in the chat and we always have to direct them to the Q&A. So please use the Q&A area for questions. This is our 30th uh, SDEC session, which is amazing. And we just crossed 3000 members in the SDEC. So super exciting. Um, I will be posting some links into the chat. If you aren't currently a member of the SDEC and maybe someone forwarded this to you and you wanna be invited to these uh, sessions and be able to view recordings of all past sessions, then it's free to join the SDEC and I'll put a link in the chat for that. Um, other than that, um, I'm gonna hand it off to Jim. We are very excited to have Jim Stern here. For those of you who don't know Jim, shame on you. You should know Jim. Uh, Jim has been uh, one of the leaders of our space, someone who I look up to a lot and I'm honored that we have him here to talk about machine learning. So Jim, I will hand it off to you. Adam, thank you very much for extremely high praise uh, uh, coming from somebody who has been in this industry for so long and, and knows so much and accomplished so much. Thank you very much. Um, I started a conference on web analytics in 2002. The audience created the Digital Analytics Association in 2004, uh, and written a bunch of books. And now in these COVID times, I've started out something called Analytics Cohorts, which is a private uh, conversation, small group over a period of time. So it's six months really get to know people. But I'm honored to be joining the search discovery education community. Thanks for inviting me. And I'm providing an introduction to learning. Uh, the goal here is for analysts to understand what machine learning is and to figure out how to put it to use. So, we know in analytics is about people, process, and technology. That never changes. But this is about the technology part. This is understanding machine learning just well enough to add it to your repertoire. So I want to start out with, um, you know, how how well do you know machine learning? Um, do you, if if you have no idea what machine learning is, you're in the right place. If you've read about a lot about it, but you think it's hype, you're in the right place. If you've taken several courses on machine learning, you're teaching yourself Python, this might be interesting. If you're a data scientist, this will help you explain machine learning to everybody else in the organization. So I hope it's gonna be a valuable, a value to everybody. But the corporation culture really matters. I mean, if you're still trying to figure it out, good, I can help. If you got a couple of people doing stuff, this is very common. Large organizations have data science teams, but they're solving problems like human resources and manufacturing and shop floor control and supply chain. They're not looking at marketing because marketing is messy. Marketing is psychology. Um, if you've got people working with machine learning apps, go talk to them. Find out about how you can get them involved in the marketing side. And if you are running a fully automated machine learning marketing platform from soup to nuts, I want to interview you and your whole company for my, my next book. All right. Machine learning is a different kind of software, but that's all it is. It's just software, but it's different. So the software that we're used to is code, whether you're writing JavaScript or HTML or C++. It is specific lines of instruction telling the machine exactly what to do. So follow the bouncing ball, do as I say, and if there's an error, pop up an error message. And if I screw up really bad, oh, it's the blue screen of death. It's just code. A mathematical model is a different kind of software. It's software that allows us to identify variables, to identify the values for those variables, to identify the relationships between those variables, I am talking about an Excel spreadsheet. It is our favorite tool. 
And the more you know how to use it, the better. In fact, there are some people who are making it possible to do machine learning kinds of things inside Excel, um, although we require a huge amount of data. So not the best place for it. But it's different from writing strict C++ code. Then we get to predictive analytics, statistics. Building statistical models is a time-honored tradition. It is complicated. It is fragile. You know, you, you build a model that looks like the world. Take a year's worth of data and take the first nine months and build a model that describes that nine months perfectly and then use it to predict out the next three months, which you have, but you're not looking at yet. So you're comparing the model's prediction against reality. And if it matches up, hey, you've got a model that might be useful for a while. But as you know, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. This is a human intense, fragile process. It takes a good deal of work. And then there's machine learning. This is a system that creates the model from the data. And as new data comes in, it changes its mind. And that's the whole point. It learns. That's the machine learning. It's not reasoning. It's not cognitively enhanced. It simply learns to adjust the model of the, of the world based on the data that it receives. And we call it artificial intelligence because intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. Three kinds of machine learning. Supervised unsupervised reinforcement. Supervised means I know the answer and I'm gonna give the machine a lot of labeled data with the answer. And then I'm gonna show it data it's never seen before and ask it to identify. So pictures of cats. Here are 100,000 pictures of cats. Here's a picture of something, is it a cat, yes or no? If it looks enough like all of the others, it says, yeah, that's a cat and it changes its idea about what a cat is because here's a new piece of input. But if it doesn't really look like a cat, maybe the cat ha is facing the wrong way or its ears are down or it's upside down. The machine says, I, I don't recognize that. So I label that as a cat and tell the machine, yes, it is. And now it's learned again and again and again. Well, you give it 100,000 pictures of cats and it gets pretty good at it. So it learns from lots of labeled data unsupervised is where I just give it the data and say, tell me something I didn't know. Here is everything I know about my customers. And these are my best customers. So one of the things I know is lifetime value. So what is it about my highest lifetime value customers? What do they have in common? And it might be uh, things that you would expect. They are in a certain income range. They're in a certain location. They uh, click on the same number of links, but it's also might be stuff you don't expect. It might be that they have in common that they're all named Bob. And while that is not in the least useful, it would be true. So it's interesting, this unsupervised way of just looking and creating structure from data. And then finally, reinforcement, where you give the machine a task and a goal. And when it gets closer to the goal, it gets a reward, reinforcement, like, a, like giving the dog a treat. And if it gets further away from the goal, it gets a detractor, a demerit. And so it tries to constantly improve itself. Best example is put the right message in front of the right person at the right time. The downside of putting the wrong message in front of the wrong person is what, a, a thousandth of a penny, not a big deal. So the more it puts ads in front of people and the more people click, it learns what ads work and it tries more things like that. So you reinforce it toward a goal and it learns. So supervised, you know the answer. Unsupervised, you don't know the answer. Um, by the way, watch out for correlation causation because it'll show you correlation. It has no idea what causation is. And reinforcement is Here's the reward for doing the right thing. Okay, those are the three big types. Now you can break that up further um, as you wanna get into different types of methods and different types of algorithms. Um, this is where if you are 
used to doing regressions and you understand the difference between regression and Bayesian, great, terrific. But take a look at classification stuff because that's interesting too. Or look over on the other side at clustering because segmentation is an analyst's best friend and this machine is really good at doing that sort of thing. When do you use it? This is the question. So here is a case of supervised learning when you know the answer, you know what a good lead looks like. You know what an ideal price or promotion looks like. So you teach the machine and it figures out through regression to make a prediction. Um, or can you, is this the kind of person who will click more on this offer versus that offer? Or what's the next best action to take? Or let's do speech recognition. Unsupervised learning is, tell me something about my customers. What kind of groups do they fall into? Uh, what, what is going on here that I should pay attention to? Um, are there any anomalies that pop out that I should drill down into? And then reinforcement, putting the right ad in front of the right person or trying different emails or trying different landing page layouts to see what is going to improve conversion rate. All of these are good machine learning problems. It's good at correlations. Um, here's an example from a, from a Chinese bank. People who filled out a loan application by hand, left-handed using upper and lower case were better risks for loans than people filling out right-handed using all uppercase. Now that is just not something you would think of as a banker to even consider measuring and yet statistically true, right? So it's good at correlations. It is segmentation, clustering and anomalies. It does all of this stuff, but it doesn't tell you if it's valuable. So if it says that sales of ice cream go up and then drownings go up. It doesn't say ice cream is causing drowning. It says there's a correlation. You have to figure out that it is summertime and it's the temperature going up that's driving both of those things. Are the, are the results valuable to the company? If the machine says when the weather is bad, people buy more stuff online. When there is a COVID outbreak worldwide, people buy more stuff online. Well, that's true, but it's not useful because I already know that but it's true. So the machine's doing the right thing. The human has to decide, is it worth looking into? So the machine is really good at ranking and sorting and data manipulation, right? The strict data stuff that you would, in the, you'd put it into a spreadsheet and you'd manipulate it yourself. And then, oh, you know what? We have too many variables. So I'm going to get some interns. I'm going to get a room of 10 interns to sit in the corner, feed them pizza and go through all of this stuff. Now I have so many variables, that's, I can't afford the pizza. I'm not even gonna to bother to solve that problem. Machine learning can. So it's really good at straight machine, uh, straight data manipulation. So what do you use that for? Testing, lead scoring. I don't know if any of you have tried x.ai meeting scheduling where you are, I wanna have a meeting with you and I email you and Amy at x.ai and you and Amy have an email conversation. Amy's looking at my schedule, knows my preferences, sets the meeting, tells me that the meeting has happened. And there's the best part. If you want to put together a, a meeting with 10 different people, I mean, that's a horrible doodle poll, right? 10 different people, if they're all using x.ai, you say, when can the 10 of us meet? And it just tells you because it's looking at everybody's calendar. All of those cases where there's a lot of data, where there's lots of transactions, and where the risk isn't too high. Um, you know, putting the wrong message in front of the wrong person, big deal. Self-driving car, hmm, big deal. So use AI for those things that do not require creativity. Use them when there's a lot of data, and a lot of repetition. Use them when there's a lot of permutations, when there are many, many variables. 
So if you've got lots of examples and good labeled data, lots of cats or lots of customers or lots of transactions. If you have so many variables that, you know, there's, there's just too many attributes, we, you can have a million, you can have 10 million customers, that's fine. But if you have a thousand attributes, okay, now we need machine learning to help out. The data has to be well labeled. So the people collecting the data and bringing it forward have to know where it's coming from and how trustworthy it is. And just don't go to it as, as the, oh, we'll just use machine learning. No, it is expensive isn't the wrong word. It is resource intensive. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of thought. It takes a lot of coordination. And the it's it, if, if you can do it in Excel, do it in Excel. If you do it in doing a regression, do it in a linear regression. But if you can't, machine learning is great. Very clear goals. It doesn't do general stuff at all. It does very specific, uh, solve this very specific problem with this data set in this time frame. And then is it worth it? If, if I just gave you the answer right now, would it, would it change your behavior? Would it change your marketing budget? Would it change your resourcing? So here's an example of AI company called Kandati that says, we're gonna take our age and gender categories and a bunch of campaign types and compare and contrast, and then understand with precision what's working. Now, if I look at this upper left-hand corner, um, yeah, so there's, you know, 10 by 10, that's something I can work out on a spreadsheet, except we're actually looking at a great deal more than that. 61,000 combinations is not worth the time for humans to figure out. Machine can do it. Machine doesn't have a problem with that. So use it when you have these particular elements in place, and then it's value. But do not use it. And by the way, if you're really interested in this stuff and you want somebody who's just brilliant at explaining it, Cassie Kozrakov is a genius. She's entertaining, she writes well, she does videos. She happens to be, I don't know, chief data or AI evangelist at Google. But even if she weren't at Google, she's, she's really followable. If you're not automating, if you don't have the data, if you can simply look up the answer, if there is no connection between the inputs and outputs, and if you come up with an answer that's okay for now, but it's not usable later, don't do it. Just don't do it. But this is by all means a go check out Cassie. She's fabulous. And here's one of the things that she created in, in one of her articles. Are you making decisions? No, I'm, I'm just curious about stuff. Oh, well then do data analytics. Are you making decisions? Yes, yes, I am, uh, but only a few. And there's no uncertainty. I mean, either it's A or it's B. Well, then great, data analytics will help you. If you're making only a few decisions and there is uncertainty and it's important, then statistics will help you. Predictive analytics will help you, a straight statistical analysis. But if you're making lots of decisions and using a huge amount of data, machine learning's for you. Here's a warning though. Um, if you're doing normal optimization of your email or your landing page or your conversion rate or your shopping cart, whatever it is, humans do a pretty good bumping along, making improvements. That's great. And then you bring in machine learning and immediately it crashes. It just makes terrible mistakes. It makes errors. It, it screws things up because it tries things pretty much at random. And then it learns really fast and does really well and pretty much amazes everybody. But then it tapers off. So what's happening here? Learning from its own mistakes is, is literally the definition of machine learning. It's like, I want more email opens and it just tries a bunch of stuff in headlines and most of it doesn't work and then something does and then something else does and it kind of finds a pattern and it does more of that, boom, it does great stuff. And then it's done about the best it can with the data that it has. It has created a model that works for this data at this point in time. And then, yeah, it can make incremental improvements. But if management is expecting huge benefits right off the top, 
they're going to be disappointed. If they expect huge benefits continuously, they're going to be disappointed. So set the proper expectation that it's going to act like a toddler and take a step and fall down and take a step and fall down and then take two steps and then take three steps and then run right out into traffic. But then it's going to taper off. It's not going to continuously improve. Uh, this morning, before this presentation, I gave a, a presentation at the Marketing Analytics Summit in Milan. And I heard about data-driven attribution. This is Google's attribution model using machine learning. Maria Bocheva has now been at Google for about a year. And she presented, and here's the data point that got my attention so that I quickly stuck it into this presentation. They only need 3,000 interactions with 300 conversions over 30 days to deliver on average a 5% lift for Google Ads. Now, that's shocking to me because that is a tiny amount of data for what machine learning usually needs. I talk about tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of cats. This is, this is a, an unbelievably small number of data points to really be believable until you realize they only need 3,000 interactions, 300 conversions over 30 days from you, but the machine is looking at it for lots and lots and lots of you. It's why machine learning is working really great at Shopify. You have a store that only has, you know, 10 people visiting a day, but they have a million stores. So they can take your data and compare it to the other 999,999 and come up with suggestions and advice on where to advertise, what kinds of offers to make, et cetera. So even if you don't have a giant pile of data, there are tools and data sets out there that can be useful, but it ain't easy. And here's the big deal. Over and over the top, the two top success criteria are doing the work to build a data infrastructure and a willingness to learn from failure. The first is tactical, the second is cultural, neither is optional. Do the work to build the data infrastructure. We know our data is not perfect and perfect is the enemy of good enough, but it's gotta be pretty good because it's going to go into a, an algorithm that is opaque. And the only way you're gonna tell if it's working is if the results out the other end are good. And before you automate everything and let it just run down the road, got to make sure that it's good. And that means making sure that your data is good, that you have a solid data pipeline, that you have data stewards in place who are responsible for each data set that you're going to put into this model. And you need, it's an investment and it's not a do once and you're done. It is constant improvement and care and feeding. And a willingness to learn from failure is absolute corporate culture. If you're in one of those companies that has a culture of um, when somebody makes a big mistake, you bring everybody together and you have a meeting and you have that person present their mistake and present what they learned from it. And everybody goes, great, thank you. Now I won't make that mistake. You're in a good company for machine learning. If you're at a company where somebody makes a mistake and they get reprimanded and they make a second mistake and they get fired, they're not, they are, this is a culture that will not tolerate machine learning. They will not understand it. So make the investment in the infrastructure. That's, that's money and people, <laughs> people process and technology. And make sure that you're in an environment that wants to learn that is willing to learn because that's literally the definition of how machine learning works. It fails and fails and fails until it doesn't, and then it does really well. And then we come up with a little caveat, <clears throat> a side note. There are some issues going on here. Um, when we look at law versus ethics, now some of you are familiar with Oralee polls. Um, who is my go-to person on GDPR and 
all things data protection. And you may be familiar with Stefan Hamal, who has decided to give himself over to ethics in data. These are people who are both very much worth watching and following. <clears throat> the law is the baseline. Law is the, the floor. Ethics are above that. Morality is above that. So if you're only following the letter of the law, you're not helping people. So pay attention to what the law says, because that's the minimum. But then ask yourself, and you know, is your company heading in the right direction? I, having just watched the Social Dilemma movie, I would not want to be Facebook right now. It's, it's a tough place to be. The next caveat, warning, is bias in the data. If I want more of the same, this is the data set I use, and there, and there is bias built in. The easiest example is when Amazon put together a system to help sort through resumes. We want to only show resumes to humans because we get so many of them. We only want to show humans the ones that are the most likely to be successful at this company. OK, say the data scientists, what constitutes success? Oh, well, they've had the most promotions. They're responsible for the most number of people. They've received the most bonuses. They've had the best reviews. And the machine said, OK, here's a bunch of resumes of old white guys. Women of color, no, they're not going to be successful here because the data shows they haven't been successful before. Amazon saw that working and went, oh, yeah, this model is wrong. It's just not going to happen. There is bias in the data. And you have to be cognizant and careful. And you have to take responsibility. And this is a tough one because an analyst is not a prime actor in the company. The analyst is the trusted advisor, doing the work in the background, bringing the insights forward, encouraging people to make change and improve outcome. Hooray. But for an analyst to stand up and say, no, I won't automate that process because requires two things, knowledge, so read up on it and know what you're talking about, and courage. And you know, if you're a junior analyst, you've only been at it for a few months and you feel uncomfortable that somebody has asked you to do something that doesn't sound ethically right, voice your discomfort. And if the company says, Oh, that's interesting. We should talk about that some more. You did a good thing. If the company says, no, 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 we don't care about that. Maybe you don't want to work there. And then finally, and here's where we're, we're running into issues. This is why I, I, the social dilemma and Facebook comment came up. There are people out there doing bad things. So if you know your history of Cambridge Analytica, they use data inappropriately for political purposes, and those are two separate things. It's not that I disagree with their politics. There, the, there was genius in how they used the data to sway and persuade, which is what marketing people do. But they used the data inappropriately, which is a really bad thing. And there are people who will use these tools for others' detriment and their betterment. And that's just, you know, if you're a sociopath and you have a tool, you'll use it to your own benefit. And that has to be watched for. And then finally, there's that classic problem of, I'm gonna keep massaging the data until it says what I want. So there are people out there who are gonna use these tools in bad ways. That's just the nature of the beast. And then comes an area where it's pure exploration. This is, the, this is really the fun part. Once you get a handle on this stuff, you know, we know that we can use it to solve problems that we have discounted before. It's like, that's too many variables, too many permutations, can't be bothered, not worth the investment. Oh, wait, now there's a tool that will do that? Oh, let's try to solve that problem. Then comes the next step. What kinds of problems have we just never considered were possible to ask, to, to solve before? That's where it gets interesting. And that's where if you come up with something new and exciting, I want to hear about it because this is, this is moving, you know, pushing the outside of the envelope. This is moving the industry forward. 
<clears throat> artificial intelligence, machine learning, it's, it's a little bit scary because it's so smart and it's going to take over my job. No, it won't. Your job is safe because <clears throat> humans will always be needed for these three things. What problem are we trying to solve? What and question are we trying to answer? The machine's just sitting there waiting for a problem. It's not going to tell you what to do. You have to tell it what to do. What problem are you solving for? What data should we use? Now, if I give it too little data, it will be very confident in the wrong answer that it comes up with. If I flip a coin three times and it comes up heads three times, the machine says 100%, it's going to come up heads again, and we know that's not true. If I give the machine too much data, and not, not too much, but too many variables, it's going to be very uncertain. It's just going to be noise. It's going to be 50-50. So I have to pick and choose which I believe <clears throat> is the most predictive data and the least number of variables so that I can do it at scale. I can put in a huge amount of data with only 100 or only 1,000 variables, and I can afford the machine time to come up with an answer. But then the answer itself is the question. It's the smell test. If the machine says that ice cream causes drowning, you go, yeah, no, it doesn't. That's not true. If the machine says, I know how to get the most email opens, you send everybody exactly the same email a thousand times within a minute and more people will open it just to see what's inside it than any other method. That is correct. That is true, but it would be stupid. So the definition of machine learning in my devil's data dictionary is being able to detect good from bad without any idea of right from wrong. And that's the human's job. What problem are we trying to solve? What data are we going to give the machine? And does the output make sense? So introduction to machine learning, that's, that's where we get started. And I hope it's been useful. Um, and I'm hoping that there might be a question or two that I might be able to answer. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jim. That was amazing. That was a lot of information in a short amount of time. So everyone out there, um, if you have questions for Jim, uh, now is the ideal time to post them to the Zoom Q&A, and we will start working our way through the questions. So uh, Jim, first question, is it safe to assume that Google's 5% lift expectation is subject to diminishing returns. For example, can't necessarily expect 5% lift every month for a year. I'd say <clears throat> not only safe to assume, absolutely correct to assume. You're going to get a bump and then it's going to have reached the end of its uh, ability to make predictions. Um, with that particular model solving that particular problem. Now, if you continue to test and try more variety in your advertising, it will have new data to chew on. Um, so can you expect to get continuous improvement? Probably not. Can you expect to get enough for improvement to make it worth the investment? I'd say yes. Okay, next question. Um, I have a mathematics degree, but I've been working in a non-analytical digital marketing role for about four years. How could I go about pivoting my career to focus on data science while benefiting from the experience I already have? What do I need to learn? What roles could I apply for? Um, you know, there's, there's two ways into this work as a digital analyst. One is I'm a statistician can you teach me marketing? And the other is, I'm a marketing person, can you teach me statistics? And they're both uh, incredibly valuable ways to show up to the party. The fact that you understand digital marketing is enormous because while statistics is, oh, it's math, it's hard, 
it's it is it is rote it is method methodological marketing is really messy so if you have a good grasp of marketing you're in a great position to start learning i'd say uh, play with the tools go dink around with google analytics if that's what's on your platform or adobe analytics if that's what your company is using and see what it's like see see what you can if you can uncover something interesting see if it holds your interest. And if you use your curiosity to answer business questions, then you, you become a scientist because you want to use it better. And we have a related question, which you may have just covered, but just in case there's anything else, uh, someone had asked, um, how should a web analyst uh, pivot into machine learning and data science roles? So that may be similar. Is there any other, anything else you want to add there? It, it is a continuum. I'm a digital marketing person. I'm going to learn about it, analytics, statistics, and analysis, and using the tools. And one of those tools is machine learning. And so I'm just carrying on. Now, how do I become a data scientist? Is um, yeah, well, come up, show me a definition of data scientist, and we can we can have that conversation. Um, if you are using data to solve business problems, you you've begun the path. You're you're on your way. So related to that, um, someone said, uh, Jim, you mentioned Python. Uh, what's a good machine learning tool set for beginners? Um, Microsoft, Google, IBM, uh, others all have toolkits that are out there um, to, to play with, to use. Um, you can, there's publicly available data sets, so you can get a massive amount of data. And there are uh, tools to play with. Um, I'd say a good one for beginners would be the one that is known by somebody you know, so that you can go to a community, go to Measure Slack, um, and and see what the conversation is, and then and then start playing. But here's an important part: use these tools to do analysis on some data set that holds your interest. If you're interested in uh, base statistics, then great, play with the baseball statistics. If you are running, if you are responsible for running your website and you've got, if you've got data, great. If you're fascinated by it, that will spur you forward. If you just wanna take a class, not the best way to go. It's, it's a good way to begin, but boy, the best way to find a data set you really care about and then start goofing around with it. Yeah, and one thing I'll add to that, Jim, um, what's interesting is uh, my, I have a son who's in high school and they're, they're starting to even teach some of this stuff in high school now, which is kind of crazy. Nice. And what uh, some of the kids did is they did as a project uh, logging all of the data for the baseball team on the high school at the high school level. And huh. they actually did a year long project of analyzing the data. And then they were doing the money ball thing for the high school baseball coach for wow. free. So there are lots of opportunities. If you think about things where data is being collected and you can go to literally like your local high school and say, listen, do you, do you have a, a kid in the class who wants to like, you know, put something good on their college application? They can maybe log everything in basketball, everything on the football team, everything in any sport. And sports tend to generate an enormous amount of data. And then you can, you know, use that data set to help your local football team or baseball team uh, get to the championship, which is a way to kind of learn. So that's kind of a fun way yeah. if you're into sports. That's terrific. And into sports, let me point out um, data.world. World is actually the high-level domain. It's data.world is a compendium of data sets that are made public. And, and go around in there and see if you find a data set that looks interesting. You can, you can do, uh, if you find two different data sets in data.world, you can do joins between them and then rock and roll. Yeah, and I know uh, Jason Thompson with someone else uh, recently, they were looking at the air quality in Utah because they were noticing that the index was really bad. And so they just grabbed a bunch of data from their local state and they started playing around with that as well. So 
in today's day and age, there is lots of data. So as Jim said, I would echo that. Find something you're passionate about. If it's climate change, uh, we just had a massive election. I'm sure there's a lot of data that came out of the election in the United States. You could probably analyze and figure out. Um, I don't think we're in a shortage of data in the world today. So find data sets you care about and see if you could start playing around with them. Uh, well, I think that's really it. The last question we have, I think you may have already covered, uh, what is a good example of tools uh, for marketing that leverage ML and AI? So I think you probably covered those, but any other tools let you me, want to rattle off? Yeah, well, let me add just a little bit. And that is, <clears throat> there's a variety of tools. You can you can go learn R and Python and, and dig down and program it yourself. You can use the tools that come with uh, large enterprise software. So if you're using Salesforce, uh, they have created Einstein and it's an ML tool on top of it. We did, I just talked about uh, Google data-driven attribution is machine learning that you can use along with Google Analytics or with, um, with Google ad advertising. Um, lots of companies have stuff that they've bolted on. Uh, Adobe has Sensei. Um, and then there's the, the startup market. So there are a lot, and I mean a lot, of venture capital dollars going into startups that are creating AI tools to do specific things. This is an AI tool for email. Here's an AI tool for content marketing. Here's an AI tool for search marketing. And those things are very much working worth looking into. So do you want to learn how to do machine learning, or do you want to learn how to use machine learning for marketing? Oh, you just you just made a career. And then one last one snuck in under the wire. Um, in general, how soon can you show ROI for machine learning? Oh, well, now I prove that I'm a consultant. The answer is, it depends. Okay, fair enough. Uh, and someone had just chimed in also that Salesforce has Einstein, which is now called Tableau CRM, maybe, I guess. So, okay, cool. Awesome. Well, I think that covers most of the questions. So, Jim, once again, thank you so much. Uh, this recording will be posted in the SDEC, uh, SDEC Slack group for prosperity. And if you have any other questions, um, Jim is available on LinkedIn, and I'm sure he'll be happy to connect and answer any questions. So, Jim, thanks again for joining us. Adam, thank you so much for having me. I always enjoy this sort of thing. Awesome. Have a great day, everyone.